Тобто почнемо з перших днів широкомасштабного вторгнення в контексті спогадів. Let's start from the first days of large-scale invasion. Memories, impressions, emotions. Our guest is Denis Monastirsky, Minister of Internal Affairs of Ukraine. Summing up this year, remembering these first spring months, the end of winter, what emotions do you have? In fact, there were no months, no weeks. There was one day that lasted very long time. Of course, the emotions were very deep, because at that moment you understand that the key role is played by the person who is standing today at the checkpoint of the Kharkiv region, the border guard. Today, the key role is played by the policemen, who realizing that there will be an invasion, and we were constantly informed about hundreds and thousands of equipment, will remain in the city to maintain law and order and engage in battle with the enemy. This is the key point in understanding that the main person in Ukraine is there, on the front lines in the trenches, at checkpoints, in the district police and fire departments. The main people of the country are there. Communicating with representatives of the President's office, the National Security and Defense Council, other statesmen, everyone says that we were all in our places and we understood how to act. In fact, the Ministry of Internal Affairs also had an understanding of what to do next. But I would like to remind you that most of the officers faced a large-scale invasion for the first time. Where does this confidence, experience and professionalism come from? You know, during these more than 10 months of large-scale invasion, the functionality of the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Ukraine system was changed by more than 80%. That is, we have all changed and therefore, of course, the challenges that we faced were the first ones for the most of the people of the ministry. But we had experience since 2014 when the district and regional departments surrendered, when the units of military in Crimea hesitated in the same way and did not open fire. Now there was an understanding that there would be no such dots and no time to wait. Fire was opened immediately. Units, even those that according to all international definitions are civilians, were engaged in battle together with the police and rescuers help people live. Therefore, the first conclusion is that we survived the system of the Ministry of Internal Affairs as the basis of the security survived. These are thousands of people who were the center of resistance in their cities, who remained in their positions, the personnel and no single regional police department sided with the enemy. As I understand, this war exposed, among other things, the problem of personal policy. For the most part, the leaders of some frontline regions, the South, Erson region, Kharkiv region perhaps, before the end of February, you said that there is a shortage of 30% in terms of personnel in the system of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, in the National Police. What is the situation now? You say that the Ministry and your departments have changed a lot during the years. But how will you move on next year and what will you do to ensure that these changes are in the other better direction? I'll tell you what changes we're talking about. For example, if the National Police, a civil law enforcement body, which as a rule is engaged in law enforcement, investigation of ordinary crimes, today we're already talking about the forming of a brigade that will be an assault brigade of the National Police. Today the whole units are fighting in the east. Today the United Detachments from Lviv, Zakarpatia and other regions that are far from the front are in the deoccupied territories. But our position is that officers and personnel should visit the deoccupied territories and accordingly special forces and those who can fight are on the front line. These are the changes in the police. The National Guard also mainly ensures public order, escorts prisoners, deals with the protection of facilities. Today 80% of the National Guard are fighting at the front. This is our pride. These are the people who today have become real heroes of our country. They are holding the defense of Bakhmut city together with the armed forces of Ukraine, holding the defense there, where the fiercest battles take place. During the first months of the war, the National Guard was supposed to gain this experience. Small operational units that were intended for military operations increased to 80%. What about the shortage, both in the police and the National Guard? The number has grown due to the mobilized new personnel who come to the National Police. The state emergency service in general are heroes without weapons, which the whole country is proud of today. 
I think that together with the armed forces, this is the body that is trusted the most. They also do the same things that our colleagues abroad do. They do not understand how it can work in such emergency situation. Well, it goes without saying that Ukrainians will be an example in training our European partners. And this applies to boost the work of law enforcement agencies, police officers and our military. You mentioned the deoccupation, and I said at the beginning that the police are the first to enter the deoccupied territories. And for the mining, we often hear that we'll remain for years, that a set of Ukraine is mined, and there is a lot of work ahead. We often hear about the help that is coming, what is needed today, or what is already in place, what agreements with our Western partners in robotics, technical means and financing, so that our law enforcement officers, representatives of the state emergency service, the national police, die less. Так, на жаль, можу сказати, що шлях і той досвід розмінування, який ми зараз добуваємо, він Unfortunately, I can say that the way and experience of demining, which we will now consider, is bloody. It is the blood of our pyrotechnicians, sappers, military, civilians, police, the state emergency service. This is a very high price that we pay every day. Every week we hear about injury and death. Why it happens? It's not that there is not enough experience, it's just that all the efforts of our enemy are aimed at making the land they live as dangerous as possible, for our children, for civilians in the first place. Of course, when pyrotechnicians come to the deoccupied territories, they understand that they have a million and tasks at the same time. They need to check the power stations, boiler houses, schools, kindergartens and roads, the railway. Unfortunately, there are tragic cases. Are we strong enough to clear mines in the shortest time? Of course not. Therefore, during this time we have doubled the number of pyrotechnicians of the State Emergency Service and will increase the staff of the State Emergency Service by 500 pyrotechnicians next year. I can say for sure that partners help us providing equipment, first of all security, bulletproof vests, special suits for pyrotechnics, demining equipment. The issue is more acute with robotic machines that can clear dangerous areas, because very often only robotics or mechanized machines can safely clear certain areas. Therefore, after the tragedies that happened with the police officers who were demining, we decide that it's easier to blow up some objects, otherwise people and specialists of the National Police and the State Emergency Service may die there. For this reason, today several pyrotechnicians from Poland are working in Ukraine, the Japanese are very helpful in demining, our Canadian partners through international organizations donate demining vehicles to us. I think that after the end of this terrible war, we will have the most numerous and most experienced pyrotechnic service on the continent. And this, of course, will be our advantage. And this is exactly what our partners in the EU are interested in. Because today we're talking about joining of our system of the Minister of Internal Affairs to the mechanism of civil protection. And they are already asking your experience in demining, evacuation, firefighting and possibility of providing appropriate assistance for Europe. They are very interested. Unfortunately, judging by the circumstances of the war, we can share this experience with our neighbors. But at the same time, we will be at the forefront of these processes. And this is also positive. You have mentioned demolition of buildings. I remember that even the police departments were mined, and they had to blow up the same departments. It seems that such a situation took place in the Kherson region. But after all, in the same police stations, schools, in the basements, the occupiers set up dungeons. Every time deoccupying our settlements, law enforcement officers find such places. How do you assess the prospects for creating a special criminal tribunal, fixing it for a minimal court, to which cases are transferred to thousands of investigators? And are there any prospects of bringing to justice? After all, we understand that this work is carried out for the future. Скажу відверто, що саме ці факти катувань Frankly speaking, it was the facts of mass torture, the killing of civilians that struck me the most. Because these are crimes against women, rape. I remember that the smallest girl who was raped is four years old, and the oldest is over 80. When we come to the deoccupied territories, these mass exhumations of hundreds of bodies with signs of violent death cannot but amaze. And of course, dungeons in every settlement. 
The places where they were kept, where such actions were committed that cannot be justified by anything. This is really a shock even for those officers who have been working in the direction of crimes and murders for many years. They say we're constantly experiencing shock from what we saw, from the stories of eyewitnesses, witnesses of these events and from what they did and are doing today in the occupied territories. That's why these crimes are a matter of honor to record them, to describe them in such a way that they become the basis of accusations in our Ukrainian courts and in any international instances. Today we're talking about the International Criminal Court, where the most significant proceedings are passed. For sure, the International Tribunal will be established, but this is about political criminal responsibility, which will be for the top political leadership of Russia. We understand that these crimes, which are repeated in absolutely all the occupied territories, cannot be a manifestation of the perpetrator's excess. You know, there is such a term when a criminal having one goal commits a greater crime, but this is his personal will. We understand that sending civilians to these tortures is the policy of the Putin regime in the occupied territories. They consciously and immediately come with this form of the Russian world, the FSB services, Kadyrov soldiers and other representatives of the National Guard come deliberately imprisoned and having exactly this experience of working with the civilian population. Talking about fixing crimes, murders, torture, we mean that these are the consequences of presence of the Russians. At the same time, after they are left this territory, their collaborators are still remain. How do you fight today with these particular collaborators? Why do they stay on the territory of Ukraine and partly do not run away together with the Russians? What are they counting on? Well, actually, most of them run away. It's a fact. But still not all of them. If we are talking about Kherson, for example, the crossing over the Dnipro River was dangerous for enemy when armed forces of Ukraine shelled, accordingly, collaborators also. Some really remained due to the fact that their former staff left them. They counted on a negligent attitude on our part, on the part of law enforcement agencies. But now the systematic work on verification by the National Police, the Security Service of Ukraine, does not give a chance to such people. There are more than 2,000 of such proceedings in the National Police. We identify people who communicated, collaborated with enemies, helped them, gave out information about our resistance movement, about our law enforcement officers. Many of our colleagues remained in the occupied territories and helped us, provided information in order to overcome the enemy. Unfortunately, there are those who are either in captivity or killed. Let's come back to today's realities, but in peaceful territories. The trend is that during these 10-11 months the crime situation has improved significantly. The percentages are different, if we speak about crimes, theft and so on. The numbers are different, but they are all positive, that is, crimes have decreased during this time. Why? I would not use the term improve. Okay, the situation has improved, crimes have decreased. There are some objective reasons for this, including the work of our system of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Don't forget about people who left, arrived, were forced to leave the territory of their settlements where they lived before the war. And partly we're speaking about a million people who left the country. On the other hand, the main attention of law enforcement officers is increased in all districts. That is the curfew that has been introduced, verification measures that are carried out at checkpoints. The operational work of law enforcement officers is dozens of times bigger compared to the time before the large-scale invasion. There are less chances to commit robbery, theft for criminals, as it happened before. I'd rather say that the very position of citizens has also changed. Today there is absolutely no perception of such violations, such crimes. If, for example, it used to be about the theft of cars, the citizens themselves create small resistant groups, which also help law enforcement officers in their residential complex. The number of crimes has decreased by 16 percent. We have already talked about the fact that the curfew was introduced from the beginning of the war and remains a very effective means of combating offenses and collaborators. Our hundreds of checkpoints detect such people, and in fact, we bring them to justice. 
But unfortunately, the war continues. Let's speak about reforms, because different ministries are still trying to follow the logic of development actions. And we often, mentioning the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the structure of the ministry, recall those first steps of reform since 2014-2015, when the national police appeared, when, let's say, the system of relations between subordinates and the leadership was updated in principle. And what will be in 2023 in this part? Is it possible to say that there will be something really positive for the officers of the system and, for example, in terms of salaries, provision and the creation of new divisions? We understand that almost 80% of the functionality has changed, and these new challenges definitely move us towards the news that will be in 2023. Payments to the security forces this year were the highest in the history of Ukraine, and obviously this is connected with the activity of our system in repelling aggression. It will be next year as well. Therefore, I thank both the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine and the society for the perception of this that we occupy a leading place next to the armed forces in repelling Russian armed aggression. As for innovations, this is of course digitalization, which should make a greater distance between those who make administrative decisions and the citizen. It is digitalization that will allow to register cars online and receive many services online. In fact, we can do this not only in Ukraine, but also abroad. Today, the challenge that millions of people are abroad has forced us to innovate, to open migration service centers abroad. Today, it has already been implemented in Poland. A number of countries are next in line, where tens of thousands of our civilians arrived and received services there. This is obtaining documents, driver's license, certificates. Today more than a hundred thousand such citizens have already received services. I understand that next year there will be more citizens who receive such services. We're also thinking about changes in the national police system and the motivation system. I have already mentioned that a combat assault brigade of the national police will be formed. Five new brigades of the National Guard are currently being created. These innovations are connected with the demilitarization of the National Guard. And at the same time, I want to keep the service of the National Police, the state border service, so that citizens feel like they live, first of all, in an independent European state.